I've been listening to you for years, man. And it influenced me a lot. He's gonna interpret for me, see? Oh, that's alright. <laughs>
y'all doing? Uh, my name is Francis Rocco Prestia. <laughs> Mr. David Garibaldi. <laughs> Mr. Lenny Pickett. <laughs> and Mr. Jeff Tamalier. So this is the part of the show where uh, we open this up a little bit. If anybody wants to ask anything, that's fine. The theme of what we're doing is uh, basically groove and just uh, how we approach the groove. And uh, so what we just did is uh, some things uh, and <laughs> attempting 
to catch the groove. Back when you guys first got together, um, when uh, you took the ghost note, like what James Jamerson was doing, like with the ghost notes, put it to a 16th note pulse, where'd you get the idea for that? How'd that all start, the rhythm, the straight 16ths with the ghost notes and stuff? How did it start? Yeah. Well, when I, when I came up, I came up with sounds um, like Motown and, and Memphis and James Brown and that was, that was my background. Uh, basically, uh, real simple R&B approach to things. And um, when David joined the band, he was a different kind of animal, as it were. <laughs> And when the two styles came together, uh, what came out of it is what I play now. It wasn't really anything thought about. It was, uh, it just, it, when we first played together, it pretty much, that's, it happened immediately. And we just kind of ran with it, so. Uh, the question I have is, I heard you saying in an interview at, in Bass Player Magazine once that, um, you kind of developed your style because uh, Dave would move a beat over by an eighth note or a sixteenth note. Could you, would you be able to demonstrate exactly how that happened or what, that's, what that is? Best example of that would be like Oakland Stroke or something, something of that nature, uh, where it's just where he would sometimes start one in a different place on a different part of the drum. He's going to play the Oakland Stroke. You guys tell me where one is. Very much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I just I, that tune right there. It's like where it goes. Shh, shh, shh. That's where I know when to come in. So. <laughs> The theme that we wanted to approach was groove, right? And uh, as I got a, just a little story I wanted to tell. Uh, you know, groove, I guess, is interpreted by many people many ways, right? And um, so this guy asked me one time, you know, I was giving him a lesson, and he said, well, what is groove, you know? And I, I never really had to describe it to anybody, you know? kind of uh, an offbeat question, I thought. And I said, well, you know, it's like, you know, it's like you're inside, you know, you're with, you're surrounding, you know, uh, you're in that place, nobody can touch you, uh, you know, and on and on, right? And he just kind of looked at me and I, I said, do you get it? He said, no. Um, so I said, well, the best way I can explain it to you then is like, just imagine your friends walking down the street, about five or six of you, and, one guy picks up a brick and throws it through the window. That kind of messed up the groove, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so he got that. You know.
Well, when I first started playing, see, I joined this band in 65. I joined as a guitar player. And uh, I was like 14 at the time. And uh, I really couldn't play guitar to save my life. I mean, I knew three chords and barely understood where they went. And um, so Emilio, the leader of the band, him and me went to school together. And uh, his, his dad uh, brought in this guitar player, Terry Saunders. And he taught us all, basically, he'd come in once a week and show us all the, uh, the latest stuff and basically taught us how to play music. And when he heard me play guitar, uh, he immediately went down to the music store and brought something back with four strings and said, you play this. Because, <laughs> you know, so that's really how it happened, too. And uh, now it's like anything past four strings scares the hell out of me. So uh, that's kind of, I just, you know, I, you go through different periods, I think. You know, I, I was 14 when that happened. And uh, as you grow, you know, you go through different, different crossroads in your life, you know, and, and as far as goals and stuff. I, you know, I think everybody wants the same thing, you know, just, you know, to, to get through this life and be happy and be the best you can be, right? Um, things along the way that that, uh, that that happen to you, you know, you, you come to those crossroads, well, do, is it worth it? Do I want to be here for the, for the long haul? And then, you know, especially if you uh, uh, start a family and so on like that, you know, and, unless you're making, obviously, great money and this and that and the other. Uh, I don't suggest for anybody to come up the way I did. Uh, uh, I suggest to learn as much as you can and uh, absorb as much as you can and uh, keep uh, keep people around you that you trust and uh, really uh, have your best interests at heart uh, for the long haul. Uh, it's very important. Um, uh, another thing to me that's important is uh, to learn to play well with others, like in the playground, you know, it's, it's really that simple. Uh, and another thing that uh, is real important to me is that uh, it's, it's, very, it's very easy to get a bad reputation, but it's very hard to get a good one back. And this business is not real forgiving, I don't, you know, I mean, People remember. I still have people coming up to me and saying, is he all right? You know, because I, I lived it. I, I know what that is. And uh, so those are the things, yeah, that, that keep me. Yeah, just, I, just from the, the simple fact of loving to, to play music, too, you know. But all those things go along with keeping my groove together, you know. One question? Mm -hmm. um, We were wondering uh, if you could play some of the grooves that you do, but slowed down, like uh, Soul Vaccination or maybe Squib Cakes, just so we can see how they're put together.
Does that help? <laughs> I play I I I play a lot of ghost notes as most of you know probably anybody that knows me. Um, and I play very it's, it gives a very percussive sound and I play things off of these two fingers and these two fingers are always on the string and the uh, that along with the attack is how how the sound really develops. Did you guys make something up on the spot? Just a jam? <laughs> Please. It's kind of fun. <laughs> I just wanted to know uh, who are your, some of your bass, favorite bass players when you were coming up or favorite rhythm sections? Yeah, I came up with sounds, like I was saying earlier. Um, like uh, Motown uh, and Memphis and Philadelphia and uh, James Brown, uh, Sly Stone. Stuff like that. Um, I didn't really find out who the players were until way later. I still don't know who all the players were. Uh, but you know, obviously, James, uh, Doc, uh, Larry, you know, you know uh, and whoever else played in those famous sounds. <laughs> I'm wondering if I can ask a question to David. Absolutely. David, I'm wondering how you come up with the drum parts you come up with. It seems like you always stay away from two and four. 
and the usual places where accents and drum patterns might come from. So I'm wondering, do you hear the accents in the bass guitar pattern and then tailor your drum part to that, or does it really start with the drums and then, Rocco, you would find your place in his drum beat? Well, we, we've, we've sort of done it all of those ways that you've described. I mean, sometimes I start with a drum beat, other times there's a bass line, sometimes maybe there's a guitar idea. So when everything's going, I try to incorporate all the things that I'm hearing, and it doesn't necessarily make me always think of two and four. Two and four to me is one type of feel, but if you can get away from that, you can create patterns that sort of have a repetitive uh, sort of a feeling and not do two and four, very similar to, to Latin music or African music, where there's really not two and four, but there's a pulse that regenerates itself, you know, every measure or two measures or whatever, right? And so that groove, you just apply the groove to those rhythms. You just play everything, you just nail it, play everything in time, build patterns around that. And what we did with the tower a lot of times and how the music is built is a lot of times the things are built around what the rhythm section does. The horns are kind of layered on top of the rhythm section. And then if there's, I don't know, different horn figures and things that I hear in the arrangement after the fact, like after we've put the tune together, then I sort of revamp my part to catch all of those different things. Okay. Thank like you. The, the what is hip groove? Yeah. That came from, if you listen to, the inspiration for that came from Freddie King's song called Going Down. So you check that out and you'll hear what is hip germ in there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Rocco Prestia. Rocco Prestia. Come on. Come on, give it up. Rocco Prestia. Thank you very much. Rocco Prestia. Here we are at Base Day 98 with Francis Rocco Prestia. And I'd like to ask you some of your early influences. It was uh, Motown and uh, <coughs> Memphis, uh, Booker T, you know. Uh, gosh, Philadelphia was happening and um, uh, James Brown was obviously very unique. Uh, Sly Stone was very unique. Um, Muscle Shoals, part of that Memphis feel, that uh, thing. Um, uh, the Meters out of Louisiana. And, and later when you found out who some of these players were, because of course they didn't list credits on albums, who, who did some of these bass players turn out to be? They turned out to be. <laughs> well, Duck Dunn, Jamerson, uh, Chuck Rainey. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people you could tell me that I don't even know. Uh, uh, Larry. Uh, uh, I guess Bootsy he was with James. Uh, also, Carol Kay, uh, uh, David Hood, uh, Joe Jamont. And it would seem like the two players who most influenced you would be Duck Dunn and James Jameson. You sort of meld those I two styles. And, and I think that the reason for that is because the organizations that they were involved with they were the highest profile, also. Uh, James Brown was certainly a big influence on everybody uh, at that time. Um, no question about it. And so was Sly. Uh, Sly even later, I think, uh, when you listen to music now, you know, uh, really influenced a lot of what you hear today even. Uh, but at that time, yeah, those were the big, you know, big sounds that were out. Philadelphia too, but not like Motown and, and, uh, and Memphis for, for, from a bass player standpoint, I don't think anyway. And you had mentioned to me that once you started uh, recognizing who these players were and you got to know Larry and you saw some of their styles, that helped you to focus in on the development of your own style and realizing the, the voice that you had, whereas in the early years you were just playing and as yeah, it were. Yeah, to, uh, to a certain degree. Uh, it, it was, I think, uh, by having the opportunity of being in the position uh, of being with an organization for as long as I have been and or was and then came back to uh, that was part of the development of being able to create a style um, uh, as far as seeing all the all the other players I, I didn't really put it in that perspective of well you know they have a voice so I have a voice uh, I think that came through years of being told that you do have a voice and and you do have something special to offer and then going through the process of actually believing it <laughs> and saying, oh, as you look back and say, I guess that was kind of special. Uh, and that's where that reality kind of starts setting in. And that, uh, that takes time to deal with because you, it's important that your ego is, uh, that you deal with that delicately, I think, you know, because uh, I can see a lot of, I have seen a lot of players get in their own way uh, and really start to believe the, uh, what does it believe, their own press or as it were, you know. It's like, it, it just because it's special and it's recognized as such, it shouldn't really change your level for why you got there in the first place. And do you feel your style has changed in, in recent years and are there any recent musical influences that have added to that other than the classic rhythm section? Mm, I don't think it's changed. I think if anything it's probably uh, 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 focused more. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, I, I think I know more who I am as a player and what my uh, my limitations are you know, as far as reality and like I wish I could. Uh, I mean, I, I know I'll never be a slap player uh, uh, because it just does not work for me, you know, so it's like I don't even think about going there anymore when it, as that style came out in the beginning. I was encouraged to, you know, go for it a little bit, and you know, but it just never took hold with me. 
uh, I think I, I know uh, how to get to point A to point B a lot easier now because of being more focused, being a little older. Uh, I'm sure uh, and it has to do with uh, becoming a little bit more mature in your playing and, uh, you know, being able to, to, to go from here to there much quicker than just like searching, searching, oh, there it is. You know, it's like you can get between there and there a lot easier. What was it in Dave's playing that got you to add motion or busyness? Uh, he plays like that. He plays with a lot of ghosting and uh, uh, in between, or a lot of implied things in between. Uh, and coming from where I was coming from, which was really simple uh, compared, it was uh, him being busy and me being simple and when it came together, the way I play now is what came out of it. But what was it that made you decide I can not still? It was a decision. It, would just, it just happened from the first rehearsal on. Uh, we only played together about three months before we recorded the first album. So it, it fell together right from the first rehearsal. It wasn't even spoke about. If you listen to the first album, you can hear just how loose it really is compared to the second album when we started to refine it a little bit more. It's almost like a jam session, the first album, and, uh, and that's, that's the way it actually happened. It was like all these doors opened up. It was like, and, you know, everything opened up for me. And I, I assumed that the same thing happened for him because I pulled him back. So was the, the use of muted or ghosted or shortened notes, was that sort of the process from, from playing with Dave? Were you playing longer notes? That's the notes? way I see it. I see it uh, as that's, I mean, maybe I was headed in that direction anyway. I don't really know. It, like I said, it wasn't a thought process. It just happened. Um, uh, it's, it, it just felt like the right thing to do. To do any less or any more didn't feel right. So that's what we did. And did the 16th note concept, did that really start with what is hip or was there actually before that? Uh, well, certainly signature wise, it started with that. Uh, just uh, uh, by listening to uh, people talk to me and talk about quote unquote who I am. That's what they always go to. So uh, it, I assume that's where it started. I never gave it much thought until much later. I still don't give it that much thought. I mean, you know, I, I mean, it's the way I play because of the uh, the ghosting and the uh, um, staccato feel is it's like it's constant anyway. So whether or not there's a real. If, whether or not there's a real note there or not, the, the constant. Uh, constant uh, droning of, of uh, syncopation is still going on, which gives it that 16th feel regardless, um, which is also just something that's part of what came out of that, uh, that, that marriage, as it were. Um, but as far as and really sticking it in your face, that was what is up. Yeah. You're not even muting that note as well. That's, that's one of the few tunes that I don't because it's important that it sticks out. The notes have uh, definition on each, uh, you know. I mean, I, I do to a certain degree when I'm doing it live uh, with the rest of the band, so I can attack it harder. So yeah, I do, I do actually live, I, I do do that uh, to a certain degree for that reason, so I can attack it a little bit harder. How were you able to make such busy bass parts work within the groove? Well, you, you know I'm not a soloist, so this, is that, this, this I guess would be my compensation for soloing, is to see what you can get away with without stepping on people's toes. <laughs> uh, to me, that's, that, that's the fun of it, is to, uh, to do what you do, interject your personality as much as possible without getting in the way. That's the, that's the creative part of it. That's, and that, that takes a lot of bouncing off, uh, especially in the rhythm section. Or, and, and with horn parts, because you have to be aware of their parts and the vocals also. But when you're working with inside the rhythm section, as we do, and we're the foundation, uh, that's, that's what we do, you know. And it's like, oh, we can stab this here, stab that there. And, and, and the groove just kind of runs with it, you know, and then you hit, you know, whatever. And, uh, but that's, that's my solo, as it were. <laughs> you know, that's, that's my, uh, that's what I get off on. 
Well, would you know why it works? What about it is making it sympathetic to the ear, not get in the way? Is it the steadiness or the... Uh, I think that's probably best answered by somebody from the outside. You know, I mean, if it feels good to me, hopefully it feels good to you. And, and believe me, if somebody in, uh, that you're playing with, they're going to let you know if, you know, you know, you got to bring that back a little bit or, you, you know, you can go further here. You know, sometimes I, I you know, it's, it's like I'll bring it back too far even. Uh, and usually, uh, like Emilio, the leader of the band, Mimi, he's, he, he's got a great ear for bass. And... Uh, it's like, no, you should be getting away there. And it's like, and I'm playing over here, and I think it's cool, and it's like, I'm just going like, or something like that, real simple. And he's like, no, that's what you should be digging in. <laughs> oh. And he's like, yeah, yeah, like that, or <laughs> something, you know. And it's like, oh, okay, well, I thought I was supposed to be over there. So, you know, somebody around you is going to let you know if, if you need to trim the fat a little bit or add some more to it. What led you to mute the notes as opposed to just playing shorter, shorter durations? Um, again, uh, not a conscious thought. Uh, I, play, I play by position. Uh, and I don't know why that, that just kind of fell into place. Uh, uh, I don't even know if I always played like that or not to be honest, but I play off of these two fingers. So if I'm, a lot of guys will go like, I'll do that, I'll move my whole hand. So I play by position. Uh, and playing percussive, percussive uh, because, of, because of the ghosting and the, uh, and the muting, it's, it gives a very percussive sound. And to attack the, the string as hard as I need to, to really make that effective, uh, leads it leads me to to attack it that way, and uh, like I said, it's just, it's this part of what makes me sound the way I do. And it seems that technique explains why you play one position at a time because you need all of those fingers. That's for right. Every note. That's right. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and in addition, do you not also mute? the string by not fretting? What is that technique you do where you're, if you don't want an actual pitch? Well, it's just a matter of just raising, raising. And so I guess if I was to take everything away, it would be. But I don't want the overtone, so. You've also stated the, it's very important for you to make a tune your own, make a bass part your own. Yeah, uh, there are times uh, when uh, writers of tunes will come to the band uh, <coughs> with very specific <coughs> uh, lines in, in mind for uh, bass or drums or gu guitar or whatever. It's not just, uh, it wouldn't be just me. But it is important for me to like do something to it, to, to make it my own, uh, and that that is not to change it by, or change the feel of what was brought, but to either add something to it or something that enables me to dig into it and feel like I'm a part of it. Uh, so it, it is just, for me. It, that's just a very important uh, that I, I I am able to do that and. Uh, so I can I can I can grab it a lot easier and feel a lot more comfortable as opposed to, okay, you play exactly, da 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 da. You know, it's like that leaves me no place to go or to be creative or feel like I'm involved with it. Uh, so, so, but if I'm given the freedom, or, or I'll, more times than not, I'll take the freedom uh, to add a little something to, to make it be something that I can identify with, as well as give them what they need as the songwriter. Do you remember any tunes that perhaps came in as demos and what you, you did to make them your own? I'm, there, I'm sure that there's more than I, than I remember. Uh, some I struggled with, uh, some was not a struggle. Uh, I guess one tune that comes to mind is uh, Sold Out. Um,
That line, uh, what, what it was, it was originally just... So I had to, and that, it, that wasn't really something that I would normally play, but I liked the way it felt. I mean, it, it fit the tune, uh, but I needed to do something to it. So I added. Uh, Uh, does another tune come to mind that you altered in some way? Um, yeah, there's a tune that we used to do for a long time uh, called uh, A Little Knowledge is a Dangerous Thing. Um, and it's, uh, the, the line is basically... So that line before I added my little part, which is that little part right there, was the little part that I added. Uh, it was it was basically. That's the way I remember it. It just was. It just repeated that that particular line over and over. Uh, and. Uh, uh, needless to say, uh, that got old real quick for me. So I needed to do something. So I, I and, and I, 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 I have very much respect for the writers when they bring something in. So I mean, I, I asked, you know, it's like, do you mind if I throw this in? So that's what I did. And it sounds more, more like me. It sounds like more like something I would play. And it certainly made me a lot more. And made it a lot more enjoyable for me to play it also. So, And again, you expanded the phrase, and then you did that great drop down, which is such an R&B tradition. Oh, good down. Coming down below. Is that, is that sort of where that came out of? Uh, I mean, I, I enjoy just going, for, I, I play more, a lot in the meat of the neck. Uh, when I go, for like, um, just to go from high to low, not to get into a line or, of any kind necessarily, but it's it's for the contrast. It just it sounds good. It feels good, um, and it is. I guess that is just from uh, early upbringing, listening to R and B. Yeah, sure. Yes, you do use the upper register fills nicely. Could you demonstrate one of those? You could just do that tune you just played. It would be great. Uh, see, that was uh, uh, a tune off the yeah, off the last album. Uh, I got the groove. Um, In addition to what is hip, a lot of your bass parts are built off steady 16ths that are, are being attacked all the time. And, and two that come to mind are only so much oil in the ground and funkifies. Can you demonstrate those bass lines? All right, let me start with the oil.
something like that. And funkifies involves not only the duration of steady sixteenths, but the octaves. So before you play that, can you offer any right hand comments about jumping those octaves? To try to give each note equal amount of um, authority. You know, uh, in, when any, any line like that, when uh, that's what you're trying to push out there, I mean, it's important that each note get this, as much equal uh, amount of uh, a time as, as the one before it, you know, so it sounds even if, it, you know, especially if that's what you're going for, you want it to be like that. I don't know, I'll play a little bit of it. <laughs> See another tune uh, that has that sixteenth feel is uh, "Soul with a Capital S." What favorite bass lines come to mind? Ah, oh, favorite. Gosh, there's so many f good bass lines out there. Um, gosh, I don't know. I'm, I guess the only thing I could think of is like stuff that we used to do uh, back in the nightclub uh, before we started doing originals, like uh, uh, Tyrone Davis, uh, can, uh, can I Change My Mind? put my own slant on that. Um, oh gosh, uh, James Brown. Uh. I could never really figure out exactly. It's like, you know, I, I changed that line so many different times. It's like, whatever felt right at the time, but just as long as it had that feel. And uh, what was another one? Uh, I feel good. One of the most difficult moves on bass is playing across the neck in an upward motion, and that's something you're especially good at. And an example I can think of is Down to the Nightclub. Can you play some of Down to the Nightclub to show us that? Another uh, facet of the 90s albums is the inclusion of some hip-hop grooves, some of the more modern loop-based grooves, and a great example of that that you play is East Bay Way. 
Could you talk about how that groove affects your part and play a little of that part? The, actually, that particular tune, uh, uh, the way we play it now and the way I recorded it is different. Uh, the, the feel is pretty, the same, you know, uh, from the rest of uh, the section, but from my standpoint, it's a little different. Uh, I think I, uh, I wish I would have had a chance to play that a little bit more before recording it because I think I capture what it's supposed to be more now than I did on record. Um, but anyway, I'll play a little bit of it. Is there any special way you're feeling that groove, or does it feel like an old groove that you're familiar with? Anything special? Um, it, it is. It's different. You know, it's uh, for me. It's different. It's not. You know, different. <laughs> um, so from that standpoint, it was. It's. It's fun to play. You know, it takes me out of. Uh, it's a lot tighter. It's a tighter groove. Um, doesn't. Uh, you, know, you have to. You know. Pick your spots much more carefully, uh, but it's fun. It's a fun thing to attack. I mean, I, I I enjoy that. Yeah, I don't get a chance to play too many shuffles in this band. Uh, uh, we have played some over the years, but uh, uh, gosh, uh, credit stands out. I guess it's kind of a funk shuffle. Um, I can play a little bit of that if you like. I don't remember all of it now, but I do remember the basic part of it. I don't remember all the changes, but uh, yeah, that was that. That was a fun tune to play. I know when I, when I was out of the band, I got a chance to play a lot of shuffles. Uh, I played with a, a blues singer, his name was Frankie Lee. Yes, yeah, Frankie Lee. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, it, it really forces you to get uh, creative because playing shuffles all night or blues all night can really bring the spirit down. <laughs> so it's kind of important to um, make the most of them, as it were. So, uh, I mean, I used to like just doing like, a, just like, a, just, you know, one, four, five changes and just kind of go for it, you know. I can play something like that if you like. Um, <laughs> Stuff like that, you know. It, I mean, basically, it's just, and then from the blues standpoint, you know, then you don't have to. See, so something more, uh, that's pretty traditional there. It's,
to just have fun with it. I mean, that's what, you know, it's just basic one, four, five, blues, shuffle, whatever. But I got a chance to play a lot of that. And it, it opened up another world, really. Another feel that's based on triplets rather than 16th notes, though not a shuffle, is still a young man. Could you show us how you work your part through that? I can do that. And that was the first song that Tower Power had written. Do you remember where you got your influence for that 12A kind of jazz bass line? Uh, actually, Dr. Mimi, that was the first tune they ever wrote. Um, that was back in, uh, gosh, 60, 68, I guess, 67, 68. Uh, they, uh, the, my understanding is that they were influenced by Curtis Mayfield, and that's where that came from. You've talked about how important Dave has been to your style. What is it like having him back in the band after his long absence? Well, it's, it's, it's great having him back. Um, uh, the thing about having Dave back is like, um, as much as we, we were, uh, we, we created a magic. Um, that's the best way I can put it. Uh, and I think uh, as time went on, especially back in the 70s, you know, uh, and we recorded more and everything, that uh, we realized that there was something there. Uh, that there was, in fact, magical that we couldn't put our fingers on that. And we would get, get other people, uh, we didn't get other people, but other people would say to us how uh, unique it was and so on. And, it, and like I said, as time went on, we began to realize just how special it was. Um, and there's no way to, uh, to, to put it into words other than to say it that simply. I've, I've played with a lot of drummers uh, since then. Uh, and, and, and to be honest, I, I don't really have a problem playing with drummers uh, or catching a groove with uh, most drummers as long as I got uh, decent time uh, is basically all I need. I asked for, you know, not that I have great time, but as long as it doesn't go like this, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, when I say magic, I mean it in the true sense of the word, because when we play together, was, when he came back, it was almost like picking up where we left off. Uh, uh, a lot of unsaid uh, things just automatically started, you know, like a lock, you know, they, each cylinder kind of, you know, comes in and locks in, and and uh, that's the way it's been since he's been back. And uh, I think we both pretty much feel we're hitting on uh, all 12 or, or damn close to it anyway. Um, but it, I mean, we definitely hit on eight right away, so that was good, you know. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a magical thing that I think we're both happy to be able to create maybe something new and take it even further. And that's, that's what we both, I think, really are looking forward to doing. 